Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Frick. I am Xavier Salomon. I'm the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator. And this, hard to believe, but it's the last week of the exhibition on Luigi Valadier, which opened in October and comes down on Monday next week. So Sunday will be the last day it's open to the public. Um, when we were thinking about um, lectures on this, uh, on this topic, on, on Valadier, Professor Jeffrey Collins was the first person I thought about because of his groundbreaking book, which came out in 2004, Papacy and Politics in 18th Century Rome, Pius VI and the Arts. Now, Valadier, uh, for all of you who've seen the show, um, worked, li well, lived and worked in Papal Rome mostly under the pontificate of Pius VI and produced several works, um, including the spectacular sets for the Carpegna cameos, one of which you see on the screen, and both of which are here in the exhibition um, on loan from the Louvre. Um, he worked for the Pope and um, for the Pope's family as well. So uh, the relationship between the artist and uh, the Pope uh, very central to this, to this man's career in Rome. Professor Collins is a professor of art history and material culture at Bard Graduate Center here in New York City. And he works mainly on 17th and 18th century Europe, but also Latin America. And he's recently been very much focusing on the intersecting cultures of archaeology and museology in 18th century Rome. Uh, this is really the time when the Vatican Museum comes into shape, more or less as we think of it, um, especially in terms of the collections of antiquities. So he's been working on, on groups of ancient sculptures which were discovered in the 1770s uh, in Rome and in Italy and then became part of the Vatican Museum as we know it today. He uh, was educated at Yale University and at Clare College in Cambridge and was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. As I mentioned, uh, his book on Pius VI came out in 2004, and tonight he will be speaking about the relationship uh, between the artist and the Pope, the power of patronage, Valadier and Pope Pius VI. Uh, I would like to remind you all that the lecture is going to be uh, streamed live and will be available for future viewing on our website. Um, at this time, please turn off all your cell phones, and the exhibition will also be uh, on view until about 7.30 this evening. So you can see it both in the downstairs lower galleries and in the oval room. Please join me in welcoming Professor Collins. Well, thank you, Xavier, for that warm welcome. And I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak here in connection with this truly splendid exhibition I can honestly say that when I first encountered uh, Luigi Valadier over 25 years ago, I never dreamed I'd be seeing some of his finest works right here in New York, much less in the very beautiful way that you and Professor Alvar Gonzalez Palacios have put them together. And having mentioned Alvar, without whom none of us would be here, I should add that my own institution, Bard Graduate Center, honored his work in 2017 with an IRIS Award for Lifetime Achievement in Scholarship. So it's thus a special honor for me to contribute to this exhibition effort and acknowledge what Alvar has taught us all over the years. Now, I've called my talk The Power of Patronage, and I want to start by explaining what I mean by that framework. When you walk into the Oval Room next door, after getting over the shock of that eye-popping centerpiece, one of the first things you see is this ancient alabaster cameo of Bacchus and Ceres in a triumphal car pulled by centaurs amid symbols related to wine and music making. The object was already famous when it was first published in the 1690s, although its current appearance is due to Valadier, who restored the bas-relief and set it in a lavish gilt bronze frame studded with dozens of additional cameos, gems, and carved agates all balanced on lions copied from a famous Roman fountain and supplemented with swimming hardstone fishes. Alvar rightly terms such works, quote, the highest expression of Roman neoclassicism, marked by both whimsy and, quote, a more virile style than was typical of the Paris of Louis XVI. They're unquestionably among the most complete expressions of Valadier's inspired fusion of ancient and modern style, materials, and motifs. 
But if we go round the back, the name we find is not Valadier's, but that of his patron, Pius VI, who claims the work as the fruit of his generosity or munificence. Today we might call that his patronage, the activity behind the scenes that made the work possible and caused it to come into being for a specific place and purpose. And I should note that Pius himself was depending on the munificence of his predecessor, Benedict XIV, who brought the private Carpegna collection from which this collage was formed. Now today, patronage can have a negative connotation, especially in politics, distributing favors or offices for private gain rather than by qualifications. Art patronage, by contrast, mecenatismo in Italian, is better understood as a symbiosis or collaboration between client and craftsman that reflects the tastes and talents of each. The Frick highlighted this dynamic in Charlotte Vignon's recent exhibition on Valadier's near contemporary Pierre Gutier, where the grouping of objects by patron helped showcase the client's role in their gestation. And here you see some of the vases Gutierre crafted for the Duc d'Omo, some reunited for the first time. This is not to say that this give and take does not benefit both parties. The patron makes the artist, but the artist also makes the patron, or at least his or her public image. That is particularly true in the collaboration I'll explore tonight between Valadier and Pope Pius VI, one of his most important patrons, and not incidentally, the head of the Roman church for the entire last quarter of the 18th century. Today, we don't immediately think of popes as patrons of luxury goods. His current holiness is certainly no fan of ostentation, preferring, preferring to appear as the simple and humble servant of the Lord. His regnal name, Francis, honors the founder of a mendicant order. He telegraphs this partly by his clothing, and when he first visited the US in 2015, NBC Washington published this helpful field guide to pontifical regalia, highlighting the ways Francis, Francis rejected both the modernist magnificence of Pope St. John Paul II on the left and the more traditional elegance of the now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, trading the red cap for white, the gold ring for silver, the famous red shoes for humble black, etc. Lest there be any doubt where Pius stood on this spectrum, this full-length portrait in the Museum of Rome, an unusual format for papal portraiture, suggests where Benedict got his ideas, right down to, as you can see, the signature scarlet loafers. I'm not suggesting that Luigi Valadier was the equivalent of Gamarelli, Rome's go-to source for style-conscious clerics. But I will argue that Valadier played a role in crafting Pius's persona as a shepherd of the faithful who was also a connoisseur and patron in his own right. Now at this point in the run of the show, I assume that Valadier himself needs little introduction. Born in Rome in 1726, Luigi took over his French-born father Andrea's goldsmith's business in 1759 before setting out on his own in larger premises on what's now the Via del Babuino near the Piazza di Spagna. Here's a view of that corner today, and I hope you can just make out the obelisk in Piazza del Popolo at the end of the street, where most travelers would enter the city and where they tended to look for lodgings. That location was strategic, putting Luigi at the center of Rome's luxury trade, surrounded by painters and sculptors' studios. Decades ago, Avar described Luigi uh, and his equally talented son Giuseppe, whom you see here in an allegorical painting, along with his mother Caterina and his little sister, as, quote, the hands of Piranesi, suggesting the ways Valadier père et fils channeled his dreams of Roman grandeur into purchasable commodities. Nothing encapsulates this better than the magnificent Désert produced in 1778 for the Bailly de Breteuil, Maltese ambassador to the Holy See, miraculously reassembled just outside this room. Valadier's glittering forest of temples, arches, obelisks, and fountains, rendered in semi-precious stones and embellished with gilt bronze, translates Piranesi's dreamlike reconstruction of Roman fora, palaces, and highways into a tabletop scale, albeit a very grand table. It's easy to see why princes and potentates from London, Paris, and St. Petersburg saw Valadier as the vehicle for their own visions of grandeur. Valadier's international appeal has long been recognized, but to better understand what Valadier offered Italian patrons, including Pius VI, I'd like to examine three objects, all on view downstairs, that encapsulate his talent and, if you will, his brand. The first is this sumptuous clock 
designed and crafted in the late 1760s for Don Abbondio Rezzonico, the Venetian-born nephew of Pope Clement XIII, whom his uncle had made a prince in 1765 and the following year, the senator of Rome. Under pontifical government, Rome had only one senator, but what that body lacked in numbers, it made up in grandeur. Here is Pompeo Batoni's contemporary portrait of Senator Abbondio, evoking the apartment at the Campidoglio for which this clock was likely made. Those of you who saw the Piranesi show at the Cooper Hewitt a few years back will remember the equally lavish table Piranesi designed for Pope Clement's other nephew, Cardinal Giambattista Rezzonico, who also lived at the Capitoline. While it's true that both works exemplify the style Piranese, as Alvar puts it, that style has a distinctly French flavor, at least in the Rezzonico clock. If we compare it to a similar example made in Paris a decade earlier, we see that Valadier has produced what the French call a cartel à poser, or a violin-shaped wall clock with its matching bracket or cul de lampe, a form Luigi presumably encountered in Paris during a trip in 1754. I've chosen this example with a case by Balthazar Yotto and a movement by Guirmier because it uses green stained horn, an effect Valadier echoed in even more luxurious green shark skin or zigrino. Luigi's version is even closer to this stunning timepiece made by Jean Baptiste de Saint Jean in the late 1740s with faceted steel hands from Tula suggesting a Russian client. What Valadier has done is to domesticate his French model by turning the somewhat generic crest ornament into a vignette of the she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus, the very symbol of Rome, while substituting the brackets rococo cartouche with the rezzonico arms and a winged female head. Now that head has sometimes been read as Medusa, but it seems to me more likely to be the goddess Roma herself as she was depicted on ancient coins. Valadier's masterful clock thus offers Rizzonico and clients like him both the apogee of French fashion, if a little out of date, and iconography that rooted their new Romanness in the soil of the Eternal City. If we turn to secular silver, an equally important part of elite self-fashioning in 18th century Europe, we see Valadier expanding his repertoire. This majestic coffee pot, also on view downstairs, was made in 1777 for Prince Sigismondo Chigi, perhaps to honor his ill-fated second marriage to a descendant of the Medici. Both the classicizing mask and bird-necked spout have been related to Piranesi and to archeological discoveries at Pompeii and Herculaneum, a link supported by the pateri or sacrificial bowls adorning the rinceau frieze and the tall neck wrapped in bound leaves. By contrast, the more naturalistic foliage at the finial spout and handle again recalls French silver, such as the coffee pot by François Thomas Germain, Luigi's exact contemporary, whom Alvar suggests he may have sought out in Paris. Yet the pot's overall form and conception, I would argue, owes more to English silver, including the high foot, tall lid, and bird form spout emerging from a mask. Male in this roc rococo example made in London 18 years before Valadier's. The vase-shaped body and stiff-leaved corona, by contrast, echo English neoclassical pots like this one from 1779, which also feature pateri at the waist. While we might not naturally connect Valadier with England, we should recall that he lived and worked just steps from Rome's British colony, whose wealthy milordi were the salvation of many an Italian merchant. This view by David Allen from about 1775, so just two years before the Chigi pot, shows a young British traveler arriving in Piazza di Spagna and immediately set upon by purveyors of old masters, both naughty and nice if we look carefully. In the background, two hostelries compete for his business, the City of London and the English Coffee House. We learn from another drawing by Allen that the area's cafes featured such homey amenities as a British-style tea table, tall clay clock, and billiard table, reminders of England's material and cultural presence in the Rome of the Grand Tour. Yet Valadier's genius was not just to Italianize French or British trends, but to offer something uniquely Roman. There's no better example of this than the fascinating table downstairs, one of a pair made in 1773 for the small Gallery of the Caesars at Palazzo Borghese. And you see it here as it was later uh, installed at the, uh, at the Borghese Villa on the Pincio. The room's imperial theme was echoed in the 12-sided porphyry top, 
a material once reserved for the emperor's use and available to Valadier only as spolia from imperial palaces or villas, much like the tables for other ancient marvels gathered from all corners of the empire. As far as I know, the 12-sided tops are unique in Italian furniture and may reflect the shape of the ancient slab. The bases themselves, with masks of the Four Seasons, are equally unprecedented in domestic furniture and look more at home to my eye in a marble-clad family chapel. A secular theme is reinforced, however, by the five light candelabra that originally surmounted the tables and are now on view at the Met. Their figural supports are adaptations of three of Rome's most admired ancient sculptures, a Venus and Amazon, and a Muse or Diana, all from local aristocratic collections. And since those candelabra can't be loaned, I give you my somewhat clumsy mock-up of the original, original configuration roughly to scale. What Valadier has done for Prince Marcantonio Borghese, his single most important patron and the city's richest man, is to distill the essence of ancient and modern Rome into elegant domestic furnishings. What ambitious Italian patron would not want to harness Valadier's talents, especially one still cementing his place in the Caput Mundi? You'll notice that all three examples that I've shown you were commissioned by members of papal families, which was an extra draw for the status conscious. That brings us to tonight's other protagonist, Count Giovanni Angelo Braschi of Cesena, elected on February 15, 1775, as Pope Pius VI. Here you see him in his election portrait by Batoni, the same painter who painted Rezzonico. As Xavier mentioned, I've written a whole book about the art patronage of Pius VI, so I'll have to rein it in to keep within my time. For tonight, I just want to stress the fraught cultural, financial, and political circumstances into which Braschi was plunged and his determination to engage the arts to argue for the continued relevance of the church and the papacy at a time both were under attack. Within Catholicism, the dominant issue was the Jesuit order, which Braschi's predecessor Clement XIV, a Franciscan, had reluctantly abolished under pressure from the Bourbon courts. The result was seen as a humiliation to the papacy, which some observers likened to the pope cutting off his own right arm. And I show you a medal recording that event, um, which is purporting to be an official papal issue, but is clearly produced as a, a, a fake outside of Rome by an anti-Jesuit faction. To get elected, Pius had to satisfy the pro-Jesuit cardinals that his heart was with them, while assuring the crown cardinals that he would not restore the order despite his personal sympathies. From outside the church, or even outside Rome, the whole papal system looked increasingly suspect, an anachronistic blend of secular and sacred power wrapped in distasteful splendor that Christianity had outgrown. Clement XIV had tried to ratchet down the grandeur, adopting a popular persona and conversing so freely with heretics that gossips called him the Protestant Pope. He was, you might say, the Pope Francis of his day. Pius, by contrast, swung back towards formality with a vengeance, doing all he could to revive and magnify the dignity of the church and its leader. As one contemporary observed, the conclave is supposed to have fixed on Cardinal Braschi to be pope from the same motive that the Roman Senate sometimes chose a dictator to restore and enforce the ancient discipline. For Braschi, discipline meant orthodoxy, but also splendor, modeled on his great Renaissance and Baroque predecessors, but expressed in a modern aesthetic language. We get a sense of that agenda in Batoni's election portrait, an early manifesto of Pius's reign, and a departure from precedence of papal imagery. The pose is traditional enough, but no pope in history, to my knowledge, had been shown with a clock, much less a clock as colorful and lavish as the one on Pius's desk. Through a streak of good fortune, I was able to locate the clock both in contemporary rep press reports and palace archives and in the Capitoline Museum, not far from where Senator Rezzonico's clock once hung. It too mobilizes Rococo forms, but in a very different material hard paste porcelain or white gold from the Saxon Royal Factory in Meissen. My research revealed that the clock was an election gift from Alessandro Ruspoli, second prince of Cerveteri, and Pius's choice to include it in his official portrait, the model for numerous studio replicas, was clearly laden with significance. I won't bore you with my discoveries about the use of clocks in portraits, but suffice it to say that Pius's adoption of a motif typically associated with prime ministers suggests his determination to keep his government and country running like a well-oiled machine. 
I should note the time on the dial for those of you who read the Italian timekeeping system also suggests that he stayed late up, uh, he stayed up late into the night caring for his people, a bit like uh, Napoleon's uh, uh, did in uh, David's famous portrait. The clock style and iconography are equally anomalous, a bizarre intrusion of secular aesthetics that would seem, angels aside, to have little to do with the papacy, although Michael Yonan's forthcoming book on the religious Rococo will surely tell us more about that. There's even a French-style fête galante visible below the dial, which seems at odds with the typical mood of pontifical portraiture. I find no way to explain this worldly extravagance except to surmise that Pius welcomed it as a sign of modernity and good taste, however old-fashioned it might have seemed in 1775. In a sense, it's the 18th century equivalent of the illuminated manuscript and silver bell included in Raphael's much earlier portrait of Leo X, and I'll give you a detail. A pontiff Braski strove to rival as protector and patron of the arts. Like Leo's treasures, the clock suggests the commitment to luxury that would animate Pius's artistic activity, including his patronage of Valadier. Since I've made that case in full in my book, I'll limit myself tonight to evoking a few of the spheres in which Pius pursued his strategic patronage of art and architecture. In the religious domain, his first major commission was a colossal new sacristy for St. Peter's. Um, you, you see it here in an aerial view here. It, it may not look large next to the basilica, but um, take my word for it, in any other location it would be vast. And I show it to you here in an 18th century view as completed by the architect Carlo Marchioni. I'll also give you a view uh, that I took from the roof of St. Peter's that suggests its sort of squid-like relationship to the basilica. The new building resolved the pressing need for adequate space to prepare the sacred rituals Pius was busy reinvigorating. And this view of the building's main sacristy suggests the lavishness Pius demanded of every surface. I discovered in the Fabrica's archives that the project went eight times over budget, partly through Braski's insistence on using exotic hardwoods, hardwoods and colored stones instead of the simple materials that Marchioni recommended. Again, Benedict versus Francis. I should also point out the massive Braski coat of arms in the middle of the pavement, which is um, about the size of an SUV. Even the subsidiary chapels were jewel boxes, more like independent churches, critics complained, than service spaces. And again, you note the Braski lilies in the floor. Every detail was luxurious, and if we compare one of Marchioni's working drawings, we see the emphasis on dramatic doorways that magnify the pomp and circumstance of religious ceremony. Although Marchioni won the competition, he was not the only one to submit plans. And here I show you the very credible project for the sacristy submitted by the 14 or 15 year old Giuseppe Valadier, Luigi's son and successor, which is arguably simpler and more logical than Marchioni's version. It's, it's certainly more classicizing. Already an astute courtier, Giuseppe made sure to include, perhaps at his father's suggestion, a weather vane based on the Braschi arms. Crowned by the papal tiara, the north wind, which was supposedly a symbol of the family's Swedish origins, puffs on a ring of potted Braschi lilies, signaling Pius's and the church's ability to bend but not break in the winds of change. Pius, in fact, was not afraid to make the most of his heraldry. As far away as Subiaco, a mountain town whose castle he'd occupied as commendatory abbot before his election, he hired the painter Liborio Cocchetti to stage the Braschi Stemma in the throne room, echoing the rather grander model by Pietro da Cortona in Rome's Palazzo Barberini, where the arms of Urban VIII miraculously assemble in heaven at the command of divine providence. I think you recognize the, the tiara scene from below, the wreath that accidentally frames the central elements of the Stemma. At this point, it must be admitted that Pius VI had a healthy self-respect, which didn't always go over with the critics. When the Pope explained in his 1776 Foundation Medal that he was rebuilding the Vatican sacristy ut vota publica impleret to fulfill the wishes of the public, Rome's talking statue Pasquino fired back, public, you lie. The prayers were not the public's, but those of your own swollen ego. That criticism didn't prevent Pius from charging ahead or from commemorating the sacristy's completion with a full-length marble statue in which the tiara-clad pontiff points toward his munificence while artfully exposing his foot for the veneration of the faithful. Pius's religious commissions were balanced by secular projects. 
Indeed, Brodsky modulated his art patronage to underscore his double role as priest and prince in the face of contemporary attacks. Like previous popes, he demonstrated his cura rerum publicarum, concern for public welfare, by investing in infrastructure and inspecting the results. Just as Benedict XIV had traveled north to the papal port of Civitavecchia, Pius voyaged south to the Pontine Marshes, a malarial zone where he was undertaking a massive drainage campaign to render the land fit for cultivation, a hugely expensive project that was only partially successful. Here you see him on one of his annual inspection tours, miraculously discovering an ancient altar with his name on it. The Swiss painter Louis Ducrot portrayed the Pope's first trip to the marshes in 1783, and al although the triumphal arch is purely fictional, it expresses the rhetoric of victory over the elements that surrounded the Pontine project. Pius loved triumphal arches, especially with his name on them, and was counted a good rider. This spawned a market for images of Pius on horseback, such as this charming terracotta at the Met. Civic leaders, meanwhile, outdid themselves in erecting ceremonial arches for the pontiff to pass through. Most were made of just lath and plaster, like, uh, but this one in Subiaco was funded by the papal government and could thus be built in stone. Pius was equally fond of obelisks, perhaps again because of their imperial overtones, and he re-erected more, re more Egyptian monoliths in Rome than any pope since Sixtus V in the late 16th century. But whereas previous papal obelisks had at least nominally celebrated Christianity's triumph over paganism, his were purely triumphs of urban beautification with minimal religious gloss. His first, outside the papal palace on the Quirinal Hill, was added to an ancient sculptural ensemble, including colossal horses, rotated 45 degrees, that now seem to have burst from the papal stables just behind them and salute the papal balcony before tearing off down the Via Venti Settembre. The effect is particularly noticeable if you're lucky enough to catch the view during a parade. Pius's delight with the effect of this project may be judged by this towering inkstand in Minneapolis, not by Valadier, but by his contemporary and competitor Vincenzo Coacci, complete with a shaped leather case. The inkstand even reproduces the project's engineering marvel. If you pull the lion's head above the drawer, the horses swivel between their original and new positions. As you'll have noticed, the combination of precious metal with polished hard stones was a mode perfected in the Valadier shop, and more than one reduced version of the inkstand has appeared on the market in recent years, typically attributed to the Valadier shop. This is after Luigi, of course. These are mostly early 19th century, and I, I can't judge the accuracy of, of the attribution. It, it could be, but there were others doing this kind of work. Pius's second obelisk at the top of the Spanish steps was equally scenographic, although its small size with respect to the base spawned some satirical hats during the carnival of 1788, according to Goethe. And you can just make it out, perhaps, between the two towers of the, uh, of the church. Pius's third and final obelisk at Piazza di Montecitorio dispensed with the cross altogether in favor of a pierced ball that restored the time-marking function the obelisk was once thought to have had in Augustus's giant horologium just steps away. And here you see a period interpretation of how it was meant to mark the sun's position on a paved meridian that's it's actually recently been uh, restored. This project, too, drew satires. One mathematician from the former Jesuit college, no fan of popes, opined that telling the time with the sundial in this age of clocks was like a, quote, poor lay capuchin in his equally poor little garden, showing his brethren the arrival of midday with a nail stuck into a wall. Not the effect Brosky desired. Having examined our two protagonists, I'd now like to study their collaboration. I should first clarify that Valadier had worked indirectly for popes before. As early as 1748, Luigi had delivered an altar garniture to the Church of Santa Polinare on commission from Benedict XIV. He'd also been asked by Clement XIII, Senator Rezzonico's uncle, to bring a monstrance destined to Mexico City to the Papal Palace for inspection. He'd also recently encountered Braschi, who as general treasurer in 1765 had authorized the export of Valadier's full-length bronze copy of The Dying Gladiator for the first Duke of Northumberland at Zion House outside of London, and here you see it in situ. This helps explain why their engagement began so promptly once a comparatively poor cardinal finally had the occasion and means to indulge his finer tastes. 
Once begun, the collaboration transformed Luigi's career and considerably increased his business, as well as his social standing. Pius's first commissions were liturgical items, some likely attended, intended as gifts, rosaries in gold and lapis, a small gold reliquary with enamels, a jasper medal, and heads of the Savior, with heads of the Savior and the Virgin Mary. Valadier even produced a ceremonial trowel for the ritual walling up of the holy door at the close of the Jubilee or Holy Year of 1775. And I think you can make out the tiara and Pipe's original coat of arms uh, on the handle uh, here. Although I'm cheating on the right by including an older medal of the door's opening from 100 years before, although the ceremony really hadn't changed. It's notable that these early works, like the Pope's prized mice and clock, are entirely Rococo in spirit. The same is true of this drawing for an inkwell with Pius's portrait, perhaps commissioned by the Pope as a gift to the uncle whom he'd created cardinal just months after his election. But Pius's tastes soon caught up with the times, and it's tempting to see Valadier's guidance as a factor in Pius's conversion to neoclassicism. Within a few years, he was commissioning quite different looking objects for his personal use, including this Egyptian style, oh, excuse me, excuse me, including this Egyptian style soup tureen delivered to the Vatican in 1782, and a pair of equally geometrical commodes in rare woods sent to the Apostolic Palace of St. Peter in July 1785. Even though they looked distinctly Roman, Valadier was still capitalizing on his French connections. The bill, which Alvar recently located in the secret archive, stipulates that the commodes are, quote, of legno di Portogallo, trimmed in gilded bronze, according to the French manner. Pais continued to employ Valadier for all manner of personal necessaries, including writing folders in red leather embossed with his arms, tobacco boxes, and dozens of pairs of eyeglasses in all sorts of materials. In October 1778, the Pope had Valadier bring his new désert for the Belle de Bauteuil to the Quirinal for personal inspection. In 1779, Luigi delivered a new inkstand to the Pope, perhaps similar to this luxurious one at the Wallace Collection, which Alvar recently identified as a 1785 gift from Cardinal Gian Maria Riminaldi. It's a little désert in its own right, with black marble ink pots atop a slab of Egyptian porphyry, offering a bit of imperial, or one might say, Borghesian splendor suitable for a pontiff. 1779 was the same year in which Pius visited Valadier's studio in person, a notable mark of favor the Pope repeated in 1780, 81, and 84, when Valadier also entertained Pius' guest, King Gustav III of Sweden. The Pope's aim on that first visit was to inspect ongoing work for the Vatican's new Museo Profano, and it was likely his satisfaction with what he saw that prompted, Luigi, that prompted Pius to knight Luigi as a cavaliere and appoint him, quote, superintendent of the restoration of ancient bronzes and the mounting of cameos for the Vatican Library. As its name implies, this new one-room profane museum was designed to hold the library's collection of non-Christian objects and to balance the sacred museum at the corridor's opposite end. Although not strictly part of the Museo Pio Clementino, it reflects Pius's campaign to turn the neglected Vatican Palace into an artistic magnet for foreigners and grand tourists. Pius and Valadier conceived the room as a jewel box lined in colorful stones and studded with luxurious cabinets holding gems, cameos, ivories, and other small antiquities. Here you see it as magnificently restored a few years ago, and here as it appeared in the late 1780s with custodians giving visitors a peek inside the cabinets. Those cabinets were the work of the Tyrolean woodworker Andrea Mimi, but took shape in Valadier's shop where he could supervise every detail. He was probably also involved in their initial design. These cabinets' importance in furniture history can hardly be overstated, including their direct copying of two antique furniture legs in alabaster, purchased the same year they were begun from the collection of Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Their even more precious contents were taken to Paris during the French depredations of 1798 and never returned. Besides the triumph of Bacchus, which we saw earlier, these included an even more colorful ensemble centered on an ancient cameo glass plaque depicting Bacchus and Ariadne, surrounded by other ancient carved glass heads, cut gems, rock crystal cuirasses, 
and a bronze billy goat. The one on the right is a modern complement. The inspiration is again Piranesian, and the best formal analogy I know for this kind of thing is the dense collage of Alantica ornaments enriching one of uh, Piranesi's one realized building, the small priory church for the Knights of Malta on the Aventine Hill. More monumental in character was the assemblage Valadier crafted around a Chalcedony bust of Augustus set atop a tiered base ringed with captives and trophies of armor. The inspiration clearly comes from urban victory monuments like that honoring Grand Duke Ferdinand I of Tuscany's triumph over the Ottomans, erected in Livorno by Pietro Tacca in 1626. Valadier must also have known Martin Desjardins' monument to Louis XIV in the Place des Victoires in Paris, destroyed in the Revolution, which featured a similar wreath crown and other signs of apotheosis. By deifying Emperor Augustus, an odd gesture for a pontiff, Pius seems to have been stressing the continuity between pagan and Christian imperia. Equally triumphalist was this entirely modern group, conceived and finished by Luigi, delivered after his death, featuring a porphyry reduction of the enthroned statue of Roma on the Campidoglio and dedicated, as you read, to the Optimus Princeps, or best prince, in this case, Pius VI. The group was obviously too triumphalist for the French, who, as you can see from this rather fancifully scaled contemporary uh, print of the group's original appearance, removed both the papal bust that Rome uh, originally held aloft and the central cameo celebrating health and abundance as an allegory for Pius's draining of the Pontine marshes, which are depicted in the bas-relief below. Yet even without these details, both the ornament and legend announce the Pope's imperial claims. The eagles and garlands come directly from the base of the Column of Trajan, an emperor whose coins feature the epithet now redirected to Pius VI. Indeed, making that claim, Optimus Princeps, put Pius in competition with other European sovereigns, not least the French kings, whose analogous borrowing of the phrase we see in the 1788 jeton of Louis XVI, just a few years after the statuette's delivery. Competition of a different sort marked Valadier's next major work for Pius VI, or rather for his family, the magnificent Désert Braski, or Braski centerpiece, unveiled in 1783, and now, like the cameos from the Museo Profano, housed at the Louvre. And I'm, I'm sorry the ensemble is hard to photograph in the Louvre as it's currently displayed, but I'll do my best. Among Pius's questionable emulations of his Renaissance and Baroque predecessors was his revival of nepotism, officially condemned by the church, but undeniably useful in extending a pope's reach and influence in secular society. Pius's younger nephew, nephew Romualdo, was created cardinal in 1786 and caused no offense. His older brother Luigi, portrayed here in 1793 by Bernardino Nocchi, was another story. Brought to Rome in 1781, Luigi Onesti was renamed Braschi, married to the blue-blooded Roman Costanza Falconieri in a spectacular ceremony overseen by the pontiff in the Sistine Chapel and lavished with a series of feudal titles culminating as the Duke of Nemi in 1786. Four years later, Pius capped the couple's rise by purchasing a Renaissance palace at Piazza Navona, which he raised to the ground and replaced with the neoclassical Palazzo Braschi, Rome's last papal family palace and a monument to unbridled cupidity. It looks very grand and isolated in this contemporary print. The reality is a little more constricted, <laughs> although the architect Cosimo Morelli did wonders with a decidedly awkward site. The building's glory is its staircase, a toplit grove of monolithic granite columns that doubles as a display space for ancient sculpture. In fact, there are sculptures at every landing under loggia-like canopies adorned with neoclassical stucco work. Even the floors of the staircase are virtual galleries of rare stone, a shocking and rather eyebrow-raising departure from the Roman tradition of reserving such grandiloquent displays for inner chambers. Here I show you one landing with some neo-antique reliefs evoking the nephew's combined braschi Onesti coat of arms. And although the Braschi Désert predates the Braschi Palace by several years, it anticipates the latter's visual and material language. These views of the plateau or platform reveal its differences from the mixed linear Désert Plateau next door. The outline is far simpler, one immense rectangle reached via elaborate stairs, 
but it's over twice as long, <sighs> imagine, with even richer materials, including crystalline amethyst backed by reddish foil for a luminous effect. Here, too, the specific choice of stone prefigures features at Palazzo Braschi, such as this amethyst-encrusted mantelpiece. And I hope you can see it doesn't really show here the sort of sparkling um, geode-like effect of this inlay, which is, again, something I've never seen anywhere else in the 18th century. I'd be very grateful if you, if you know of others. Returning to the Désert, we see the same mix of simple geometry with costly and exotic materials. As in the Braschi staircase, even the platform is used for display. A miniature theatrical mask is tied on with a gilt bronze ribbon, while 44 now empty sockets once held ancient imperial gold, gold coins, each labeled in enamel, which could be rotated for inspection. You maybe just see one of those sockets here and here. When it, when it arrived in Paris, the coins were taken out and uh, given to Empress Josephine and, and lost. And uh, perhaps the system behind that is a bit more visible in this photograph here, sparking conversation uh, over dessert. The superstructure of the dessert was also radically different from the examples that had preceded it. Although the Braschi centerpiece naturally contained at least two obelisks, it focused not on buildings, but on sculpture, including hundreds of busts and statuettes in marble, bronze, and colored stone, some old, some new, many now lost or damaged. Here you see a few of those that remain, together with the Herm of Bacchus now at the Met. Taken together, these sculptures represented every facet of ancient life and formed, in the words of the contemporary Roman press, quote, a kind of museum. That was precisely the idea. To a diner at Duke Braschi's table, Valadier's 19-foot-long centerpiece replicated a visit to the Museum of Ancient Sculpture his uncle was busy creating at the Vatican, capitalizing on an existing nucleus, but radically expanding its scope and scale. Here you see the gallery of statues established under Pius's predecessor, which the Braschi Pope refurbished and extended. Here, by contrast, Pius celebrates the construction of an entirely new wing, the Museum Pium, inspired by ancient palaces and baths, whose bold geometric shapes fill the plan uh, his architect features at left. I hope you can just make out Simonetti carrying the plan of this innovative museum. These rooms include a 10-sided Hall of the Muses, displaying statues unearthed outside of Tivoli just days before Pius' election. And I show it to you here in a contemporary view. And then just next door to this, a soaring pantheon-like rotunda reserved for colossal statues and paved with an immense mosaic from the baths at Utricoli. I should emphasize that this kind of museum planning, displaying classical statues in neoclassical rooms, was not a Roman, but an English invention, a sign that Pius's architects, as well as Goldsmith, looked north for ideas. Here, for comparison, is the sculpture gallery at Newby Hall in Yorkshire, designed by Robert Adam a decade earlier. Museum making became central to Pius's public image, and he was frequently depicted in, his hall, in its halls. Here, he's shown visiting the Hall of the Muses with his curator, and to the right, he's shown alone, contemplating some ancient historian or philosopher while leaning on the bust of museums, uh, the bust of uh, Pericles in the museum, a historical figure with whom he clearly identified. In a wonderful coincidence, this statuette, realized in biscuit porcelain, may itself have been intended to grace a dessert table, along with similar biscuit reductions of the museum's other statues. As you can tell from this quick tour, drama and color were key to the museum's impact. This was nowhere more apparent than at its monumental entrance. Guarded by two Egyptianizing telemons or sentinels in red Aswan granite, the portal was flanked by porphyry sarcophagi with a colored mosaic below. I think you see those here. It's thus no coincidence that this tomb-like gateway inspired Valadier to design this fanciful Egyptian clock, also executed in granite and porphyry with an inset micro mosaic for his established client, Marc Antonio Borghese. In a sense, this Borghese clock marks Pius's arrival as a patron. Rather than Pope imitating Prince, here it's the Prince imitating the Pope. More broadly, the clock's design and materials acknowledge Pius's championing of a more rigorous neoclassicism that would dominate the next generation. 
Indeed, the clock honors both the form and spirit of the Museo Pio Clementino. For if Pius's museum was intended to be a beacon for grand tourists and scholars, it was also meant as a refuge and school for the arts. In this fragment from Bernardino Nocchi's 1788 ceiling in the apartment of Cardinal Romualdo Braschi, the winged genius of Rome invites the languid and neglected figures of architecture, painting, and sculpture to rise and enter the museum's front door. Luigi Valigier joined them for a time, but by 1785, the pressures of working for popes and princes, not all of whom paid their bills on time or even at all, had proved too much. On September 15th, Valadier left his shop, apparently half crazed after some devastating financial news, and threw himself into the Tiber, not far from where the exotic marbles he worked had entered the city in antiquity. His son Giuseppe, beloved by the Pope, carried on the shop, including his completion of the colossal Campanone or Great Bell for St. Peter's, whose devilishly difficult casting may have exacerbated Luigi's despair. Once consecrated by the pontiff, as recorded here in a souvenir book Giuseppe produced in his father's honor, the bell was installed on the facade beneath mosaic-fronted clocks Giuseppe himself had designed. Its sound was reportedly not perfect, but it marked a symbolic completion of the rebuilding campaign begun three centuries before. And just in time. Within 10 years, the French had invaded Italy and were soon menacing Rome. In February 1798, Pius himself was exiled from his capital and taken north over the Alps to die on the eve of the 19th century as a political prisoner in the citadel at Valence. His death certificate said it all. Name, John Brasky. Occupation, pontiff. With Pius VI died not just the old regime, but a distinctive strand of Roman visual and material culture. The Valadier shop survived, as did the papacy, to many people's surprise. I hope I've showed that what Valadier created for his papal patron were true collaborations, which neither could have realized alone. Pius VI helped Valadier become far more than a goldsmith, and Valadier helped Pius compete for prestige in an increasingly hostile world. And lest there be any doubt that artists are still helping to burnish our leaders' images, just ask Bill Clinton or Barack Obama. But maybe not, or at least not yet, his successor. Thank you.